and welcome to part two of the Bronco Exchange. I'm your host, Dr. Shanessa Fenner, and today we have District Attorney Billy West. Hi, Billy. How are you? I'm doing great. Billy, let's talk a little bit about homelessness. Um, not a day goes by, Billy, that I, I don't get out of the car and I have someone, you know, ma'am, may I have a dollar? Ma'am, could you buy me something to eat? You know, and yes, I do help. I've, I've bought many meals, Billy. I've bought many of Happy Meals, many of Chick-fil-A meals, you know. Let's talk a little bit about homeless because to me, I, it feels like it's increasing because I'm getting a lot more people coming up to me. Kind of talk with me a little bit about that. Yeah, unfortunately, in the criminal justice system, we see it a lot. And where we see it is uh, sometimes over at the jail, the homeless folks, uh, create, uh, commit minor crimes and, and end up in the jail. There's even sad cases of them committing crimes so they can end up in the jail. So they have a roof over their head and three meals a day. And, and where we also see it is our treatment courts. We have a, a veterans treatment court, a drug treatment court. Um, mental health? Mental health court. And uh, we work closely with those uh, to try when someone has committed a nonviolent offense to work with them to deal with their underlying problem, which in many cases is a drug addiction or a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. And normally with our homeless population, it's not uncommon for them to have both or certainly one of those two things. And uh, we try to work with those folks, but uh, we, we've had a lot of homeless people in those programs and we've had some successes, uh, but it's certainly a problem here in Cumberland County and, and across the nation. Okay, what are some of the things, Billy, that you all are doing? Because I understand a lot of the reasons or the root causes of homelessness, like you said, is because of a mental issue or some kind of drug problem. Well, how, how, do you, how do you treat that so that hopefully one day they will no longer need to be homeless or have to be homeless? Well, we have uh, one program called the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. We were the first in the southeastern United States to have it here in Fayetteville. And the idea behind the program is when an officer comes upon someone who has a small amount of drugs, who is clearly not a drug trafficker, not a drug dealer, but they are a user of a controlled substance and they're addicted to it. They give that person the option of going through this treatment program, getting help, and we try to help them with life skills, uh, job skills, uh, uh, placement where they can uh, have a place, a uh, roof over their head and that sort of thing, and, and, and try to give somebody that opportunity instead of them just going through the criminal justice system not addressing their underlying issue of substance abuse and coming out with some type of conviction uh, and, and then you know that conviction follows them years down the road. So you know we want to use the criminal charge as an opportunity to help that person instead of just sending them through the system. And we've had some successes and that's being replicated across the country. But like I said, we were the first in the southeastern United States. So that's an example of how one of our programs works. Okay. If, if I remember, if I recall, we've had mental facilities, I think, in Raleigh that were shut down and closed down. I've never understood that, Billy, because we need them. I mean, is there a talk of us having a mental facility here as well? Maybe we need a mental hospital here in Fayetteville. Yeah, m mental health is a big problem, and we see it a lot mm -hmm. uh, over at the jail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and unfortunately, we don't have enough mental health facilities. Um, there's just not that many beds uh, in the hospital system or in our community. Uh, for um, those with mental health problems and, and, and so that's, that is really a need and we try to, we, we have a mental health court, um, our Chief District Court Judge Robert Steele and my staff as well as the uh, substance abuse uh, counselors, all kind of people try to work together, the Sheriff's Office, to help these individuals but it's hard because we're basically doing that with, with no funding, uh, no place where we can house these folks, we're just kind of having to work through that. So uh, it's certainly a big problem that I think needs more resources. It sure does. Speaking of drugs, opioids, let's talk a little bit about those, opioids. Yeah, we, we are certainly in the middle of what we call the opioid crisis. Uh, we had the uh, cocaine and crack cocaine uh, crisis back in the 80s and 90s and, and that did a lot of damage to a lot of people. Um, this is similar to that. Um, one difference we see is the, the opioids, there's a really real danger of an overdose that can lead to a death. Um, there are more overdose deaths in North Carolina than traffic accident deaths or gun violence deaths. And that stat surprises a lot of people. But uh, what we see is that the drug traffickers, uh, they use a chemical called fentanyl uh, in, in um, tandem with the opioids. Not only is it very addictive, but it's very dangerous, 
and, and literally a drop of that fentanyl uh, substance is enough to kill someone. And so um, we have really seen an uptick in the last 10 years of overdose deaths. And um, again, through our treatment programs, through prosecution, through legislation, uh, we're trying to do everything we can to combat this epidemic, but it is an epidemic and, and it hits all demographics. It doesn't matter your income level, um, your education level, uh, we, we've seen overdose deaths and people that are addicted to these substances, just like we did with the cocaine epidemic in the 80s and 90s. Mm -mm -mm. So what are some of the things that you all have in place, Billy, to fight this? Our treatment courts are the primary thing that, that we are doing, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're seeing some success there. Um, awareness is some of what we're doing as well. I know that the uh, uh, county commissioners, uh, Commissioner Evans and, and uh, Adams and others and Keefe, uh, we're able to get a grant um, for us to have a opioid task force, which in, involved the hospital, the court system, the commissioners, county services, that sort of thing, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and working together. But I think one of the key things is awareness for people to know how dangerous it is and what a problem this is, and then treatment, because that's the only thing that is going to get folks out of that type of lifestyle is for them to get into a treatment program that works for them, but um, it is a, a very dangerous epidemic that we have right now. We need to continue to fight it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your veterans treatment program. What kinds of things do you help to assist our veterans? Yeah, our veterans treatment court um, was one of the first in the state. We were a logical place for it uh, because we're uh, neighbors with Fort Bragg and we, you know, uh, respect so much what our military personnel do for us, but what we see a lot of times is our veterans, um, they come out of their military careers with PTSD, with substance abuse problems, uh, with anxiety problems, that really we as a society are having a hard time being able to work with them and they're having a hard time adjusting uh, to life after military service. And so what our Veteran Treatment Court is, if a veteran is charged with a nonviolent offense, uh, in many cases, they'll have the opportunity to go through our Veterans Treatment Court, which again tries to address those underlying issues, substance abuse, mental health, anxiety, whatever the case may be, homelessness, and try to help that person and again make the nonviolent criminal charge uh, a point in their life <clears throat> where a change is made instead of just continuing it or making it worse. And, and we have had some success with that. Okay. Billy, let's talk about minor crimes versus major crimes. Yeah, there, there is a, a big distinction. I mean, our violent crimes, we really try to focus on um, homicide, sexual assault, armed robbery. Um, I consider drug trafficking a, a minor, a, a, you know, a major crime because of all the damage that it can do to our society. So those individuals, we really try to prosecute them uh, to the fullest extent that we can and get justice in those cases, particularly for the person that was robbed, sexually assaulted, or killed. We then have a whole subset of nonviolent crime, which can be, you know, simple drug uh, possession, petty theft like shoplifting, um, that sort of thing. And those certainly are crimes. Those individuals need to be accountable, but we try to handle the two situations differently because a lot of times with what I the, the nonviolent crimes that are a little less serious, there is an underlying issue like a drug addiction, um, like homelessness or like a lack of financial means. Whereas on the violent crime, whether there's an underlying issue or not, when they've committed something that is so serious and has affected another person's life to that extent, we've got to get justice in that case. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum. Um, there's 100,000 cases that we have each year, and that's the, that's the seat belt or speeding ticket, and then that's the sexual assault and the murder. So um, it's a lot of cases to work through, and each case is, is different and um, requires a different level of attention. Speaking of sexual assault, let's talk a little bit about the Ramsey Street Rapist. Sure. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, we have a cold case sexual assault unit. Um, we work with uh, predominantly the police department, but the sheriff's office also does a good job with these type of cases. And with the uh, DNA and the developments we've had in DNA, um, what can happen is we've got a sexual assault kit where somebody reported a sexual assault years ago. But what happens is, is that 
we don't know who the perpetrator is. If they're not in the database or the system, there's nobody to match that up if the person did not know their perpetrator. But in many cases, now 15 or 20 years later, we can run that DNA through a system which has a database now that has got 15 or 20 more years of individuals that have been entered into it. And unfortunately, if someone committed a violent sexual offense 10 or 15 years ago, it probably wasn't the only time they did it. And because of that, we've been able to get um, what we call some uh, DNA hits in cold cases mm -hmm. where we've been able to go back and charge sexual assaults that occurred years ago because we had this unknown DNA and now we're able to match it um, to someone that in many cases has committed another crime. Um, and you mentioned the Ramsey Street uh, rapist case. I can't talk about the specific facts of that case, but okay. uh, what I can say is it came out of our cold case sexual assault unit. Uh, we were able to charge an individual uh, with those rapes that occurred on the Ramsey Street corridor um, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and those cases are working its way through the system and we'll do what we can to get justice for those victims. Okay, well good. Speaking of victims, let's talk a little bit about victim services. Yeah, victim services is something that's very important. Like I said, I've got 25 or 30 legal assistants and it is very traumatic for someone when not only a family member is a victim of a homicide or not only when they're sexually assaulted, but for someone whose house or car is broken into, a lot of times that's the first time something like that has, helped, has happened to them. So we try to work with them. The criminal justice system is complicated and many times it's slow and frustrating to be frank. And so we yes, try to is. explain to them what to expect, uh, what's happening, why it's happening. And then when it comes to our sexual assaults, our human trafficking, our homicides, uh, we actually have support groups and victim advocates that we work with to help those people through that difficult time in their life. And so uh, we really just try to keep our victims informed um, and work with them to try to get justice in their cases. Okay. Now, Billy, you have a very stressful job. It's very overwhelming. What do you do to unwind and, and to remain sane? <laughs> well, you know, I think two things do that for me. First is my family, mm -hmm. uh, my wife, Susanna, and my, uh, my children, Will and Lila who are uh, nine and six. You know, when I come home at the end of the day, uh, I'm just dad and I'm just Billy and uh, we have a very normal family life where we enjoy time together. We enjoy church and sports and mm -hmm. gymnastics and, and that sort of thing. So that kind of keeps everything in perspective mm -hmm. and helps. And then um, uh, I played uh, college golf at NC State years ago. And oh. so golf has always been a passion of mine. Okay. And so when I do have some free time, I like to do that maybe in the evenings uh, when we have longer and warmer days in the spring and summer and then on the weekends and that sort of thing. And I do it with my, my father uh, who lives here in the community and uh, is a golfer as well as my son is starting to play some too. Okay. So I do those things to kind of decompress a little mm -hmm. bit and, uh, and certainly separate that from what I do during the day. Exactly. Now before we wrap up, Billy, I want you to tell our viewers what is one thing that the viewers would be surprised to know about you? One thing they would be surprised to know about you. Uh, I would say the one thing is just um, that my desire to help people as the district attorney, mm -hmm. um, and that that's what I like. That's uh, that's really what I like doing, and, and mm -hmm. that can mean um, helping the family whose person whose life was lost in a homicide, like Shania Davis, for example. Okay. But it can also mean a person that has had a tough life charged with a minor crime and we can get them in our treatment program mm -hmm. or uh, Charles Evans and I can get them in our expungement clinic and they've had this conviction which has kept them from getting a job for 10 or 15 years and we're able to clear that conviction mm -hmm. and they can move on with their life so there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from that mm -hmm. as there is satisfaction for getting justice in the violent crime so just the fact that what I enjoy each day is helping people um, is usually when I tell folks that is something that surprises them that that's really kind of what motivates me to do the job every day. Okay, well I thank you Billy. Thank you, it's been an honor. Thank you. And I thank you viewing audience for listening and tuning in to the Bronco Exchange. I'm your host Dr. Shanessa Finner. Have a good one. Stranger, stranger.